Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be, depending on where you are in the world. I am Sne Arora, head of uh, the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiatives office in London. Welcome to our high-level dialogue, Delivering a Common Future to Eradicate Modern Slavery, organized by the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and Walk Free. I would like to introduce you to our moderator for our high-level dialogue, Mr. Roger Hearing. Roger is a seasoned broadcaster, journalist, and former BBC News presenter. I turn the floor now to Roger. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Sine. Yes, good morning and welcome to the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and Walk Free High Level Dialogue, delivering a common future to eradicate modern slavery. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to join you all today to discuss a critical issue, the eradication of modern slavery from the Commonwealth. The 2021 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in June offers a real opportunity to deliver on the promises made in 2018, including the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal Target 8.7. Well, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce to you Sanjoy Hazarika from Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and Grace Forrest from Walk Through Free, who are going to be making opening remarks. First of all, let me introduce them. Sanjoy Hazarika is the International Director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative based at its headquarters in New Delhi. The Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative works towards the practical realization of human rights across all regions. And it's the founder of the Commonwealth 8.7 Network, a global group of 60 plus local civil society organizations working towards a shared vision to eradicate contemporary forms of slavery. Uh, let me introduce Sanjoy. Sanjoy. Thank you, uh, Roger. Let me join you and Sne in adding my very warm well welcome to our distinguished panelists, participants, and yourself as moderator to this high-level dialogue delivering a common future to eradicate modern slavery. This high-level dialogue is co-hosted, as you've said, by CHRI and Walk Free to discuss and find ways to address the dire situation of millions of victims of modern slavery in the Commonwealth, ahead of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting or Chogam in Kigali in June. I especially wish to welcome our esteemed panelists, including Her Excellency, Ms. Lazat Shamim Khan, President of the United Nations Human Rights Council, the Right Honorable Theresa May, MP, former Prime Minister of the UK, and Member of Parliament for Maiden May. Francisca Avan Bulli, founding director of the Survivors Network Cameroon, as well as Dame Sarah Thornton, the Independent Envy Slavery Commissioner, and Jennifer Townsend of the UK FCDO, and others, including High Commissioners from a large number of Commonwealth states. And I want to thank the amazing team from Walk Free and CHRI for putting this together. I think it's important that we meet that we reflect that we meet at a truly calamitous time. We're only just beginning to fathom the ramifications of the global upheaval caused by the pandemic of COVID-19 this past year, and it's continuing. It appears like something out of a horror movie, but only to realize the restrictions remain on large sections of the world's population. Containment zones continue, and there is little let up in the war to contain the virus. We have seen how governments and privileged groups have gotten away with abuse of power. Basic freedoms of expression, information, assembly and association have been curtailed. Glo global supply chains have been disrupted. Exploitation thrives. And in all this, the most unprotected and vulnerable groups, those we speak of today, remain unreached by broken criminal justice systems. Three years ago, CHRI partnered with Walk Free to collaborate on vital research to monitor common Commonwealth government responses to contemporary forms of slavery. And I'm honored to be delivering these remarks today with Grace Forrest, Walk Free's co-founder and director. This partnership culminated in the publication of a comprehensive report assessing government progress or the lack of it towards eradicating modern slavery last June. 
Since the launch of the report, we've called for modern slavery to be set firmly on the agenda for Chogam 2021. The partnership between our two organizations seeks to reinvigorate a process that at the official level seems to have slowed, if not stalled. And as Commonwealth states rebuild their economies in the aftermath of the pandemic, governments must commit the necessary resources to implement timely, concrete action to eradicate modern slavery by supporting survivors, creating a robust criminal justice system, collaborating internally and across borders, addressing risk factors for the most vulnerable, and effectively monitoring business supply chains. We are joined today by representatives from states, international organizations, civil society, and academia to discuss efforts to eradicate contemporary forms of slavery. We face a situation where an estimated 40.3 million people were trapped in situations of contemporary forms of slavery before the COVID-19 outbreak. Almost 40% of them live in Commonwealth countries. That means that one in every 150 people in the Commonwealth are living in conditions of modern slavery. The pandemic has made those on the margins far more vulnerable to exploitation, pushing them closer to an abyss. CHRI, along with some 50 plus grassroots organizations, drives this Commonwealth 8.7 network to address and tackle these issues. This high level dialogue has three simple objectives. One is to raise awareness of the issues of modern slavery, to support the Commonwealth's common goal to eradicate all forms of modern slavery by reminding its members of and holding them to their commitments. And thirdly, to encourage the development and implementation of concrete time bound plans for the realization of these commitments. In closing, I'd like to say that there are encouraging signs of progress, as we have seen with the leadership of the Right Honorable Theresa May, former Prime Minister. Yet so much more needs to be done, and the window of time is shrinking rapidly as we head to 2020 and the hopeful completion of the Sustainable Development Goals. We need robust monitoring and implementation of goals. I believe that one of the many lessons of this pandemic is the need for mental wellness and caregiving. Many of us, I'm sure, who are on this call are tired of being zoomed in and zoomed out of meetings. We miss the privilege and joy of simple human contact. The condition of the oppressed and trafficked is so much worse. Victims, survivors, and those who work to free them, both stakeholders and human rights defenders, do not receive enough care. Through this event, I urge Commonwealth leaders to prioritize this area of mental wellness, for it comprises a hidden and unhealed pandemic that we can no longer ignore. The theme for this year's Chogam is delivering a common future. That common future must be a modern future based on equality and free from the abuse and bondage of contemporary forms of slavery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjoy, for that welcome, as well as thoughtful and inspiring remarks. The time is indeed now for concrete, as you said, concrete time-bound actions. I think that sticks in the mind. Uh, let's next bring in Grace Forrest. Now, Grace is the co-founder and director of Walk Free, an international human rights group focused on the eradication of modern slavery and creator of the world's leading data set on modern slavery, the Global Slavery Index. In addition to her work with Walk Free, Grace is Young Australian of the Year for Western Australia and was selected as one of 10 global leaders in One Young World's Young Leaders Against Sexual Violence Initiative. Now, Grace is unfortunately unable to join us virtually in person, uh, but she was able to pre-record some opening remarks. Let's hear them. Good morning, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I apologise that I'm unable to join you in person, but I am incredibly honoured to deliver opening remarks today. 
I'm here to talk about modern slavery in the Commonwealth and how you, in your leadership roles in each Commonwealth nation, can help eradicate it. One in every 150 people in the Commonwealth is living in modern slavery. That is not a statistic from the 1700s when the transatlantic slave trade was at its peak. It was taken from Walk Free's 2018 Global Slavery Index, the world's leading data set on measuring and understanding modern slavery. No country is immune to modern slavery. In fact, it exists in each of the 54 nations that make up the Commonwealth and is deeply embedded in our transnational supply chains. Whether it is a construction worker or garment worker held in a situation of forced labour, a fisherman trapped in debt bondage, or a young girl forced into marriage, modern slavery persists in all of our nations. While our prevalence estimates in 2018 were staggering, the COVID-19 pandemic has compounded our collective vulnerability to modern slavery, maybe tenfold. Widespread job losses, restrictions on movement, and the disruption and closure of regular migration pathways have all created the perfect conditions for modern slavery to thrive. Millions of workers have been stranded, unable to support themselves, and in most cases, they are excluded from national health plans. Women and girls are the most vulnerable to modern slavery. It is estimated that 71% of all victims of modern slavery are women and girls, overrepresented in forced and child marriages, as well as in forced labour. So, what can we do about it? In 2018, Commonwealth countries committed to the eradication of modern slavery in the Commonwealth, in line with all sustainable development goals, and specifically Target 8.7. Since this time, we have worked with the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative to highlight that sadly, progress across all Commonwealth states is far too slow. A lack of legislation across most Commonwealth states undermines attempts to both deter and convict perpetrators of modern slavery. Almost a fifth of countries have yet to criminalise human trafficking, while forced labour is not yet criminalised in 35% of countries. Two thirds continue to fail to make forced marriage illegal. So, the question remains, how much slavery are we willing to tolerate in the Commonwealth? If the answer is zero, it's time we step up to put concrete, coordinated action plans in place. Something that our joint report, Eradicating Modern Slavery, produced by Walk Free and the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, sets out for every member state and region represented here today. If we are committed to eradicating slavery by 2030, we cannot wait a moment longer. That's why high-level dialogues like this are so important. They highlight the problems we all face to find common solutions as a commonwealth. Together, we must support survivors, put an end to child and forced marriage, strengthen our criminal justice systems, and eradicate normalised exploitation from supply chains of the goods we buy and use every day. Every government must now act. By doing so, we strengthen the fabric of our democracies and truly begin the journey of building a common future. We are 2.4 billion people spread across 54 diverse nations. Together, we could lead the world in ending slavery once and for all in our lifetime. An excellent rousing speech there from Grace Forrest about the importance of concrete action to tackle modern slavery two key points no country is immune and we need to build a common future let's move on to the next part of this dialogue talking about the eradication of modern slavery and human trafficking and a call to action it's now my honor to introduce her excellency Ms. najad shamin khan who served as president of the united nations human rights council since january this year she's also served as the permanent representative for the government of Fiji to the United Nations in Geneva since 2014. Welcome, Ambassador Khan. Um, let me ask you, if I may, to start with, as President of the United Nations Human Rights Council, what level of priority would you place on our collective action to eradicate modern slavery? Thank you very much indeed, um, Excellencies, dear colleagues. Um, you've heard already that I am the Ambassador of the Republic of Fiji to the UN in Geneva and also that I am the president of the Human Rights Council this year. And it is my great honor to speak to you all today. 
Um, at the outset, I would like to thank the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and Walk Free for organizing this important high-level dialogue on delivering a common future to eradicate modern slavery. And this is an issue that the United Nations has long recognized as re requiring our attention. This recognition extends back to 1948, when, as we all know, the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 4 of which provides that no one shall be held in slavery or servitude, and that slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. Dear colleagues, it is, however, disheartening to note that slavery and the slave trade have not been eradicated. This is not to say that the United Nations has not been continuing its efforts to work towards that goal. Indeed, on the 15th of November 2000, the General Assembly adopted the Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the prot Protocols thereto, and two of those protocols are particularly important to our efforts to combat slavery, the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, which is the first global legally binding instrument with an agreed definition on trafficking in persons, and the protocol against the smuggling of migrants by land, sea, and air, which aims at protecting the rights of smuggled migrants and preventing the worst forms of their exploitation. Encouragingly, the former has 178 states parties, the latter has 150. More recently in 2015, the United Nations adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And under Goal 8, which is focused on decent work, is Target 8.7, through which leaders committed to take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor, end modern slavery and human trafficking, and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst forms of child labor, including recruitment and the use of child soldiers, and by 2025, to end child labor in all its forms. Of course, we must remember that eradicating forced labor and ending modern slavery and human trafficking and achieving target 8.7 is intimately linked to achieving all other sustainable development goals. For example, as we move towards ending poverty in all its forms, in line with goal one, achieving gender equality in line with goal five, and reducing inequalities within and among countries in line with goal 10, we eliminate a number of factors that make individuals vulnerable to modern slavery. Excellencies, dear colleagues, the United Nations Human Rights Council actively participates in international efforts to eradicate slavery. In 2007, the Council established the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery, including its causes and consequences to promote the effective application of relevant international norms and standards on slavery and recommend actions and measures applicable at the national, regional and international levels to eliminate slavery practices wherever they occur. In September 2019, the Human Rights Council decided by consensus to renew the mandate for another three years and requested that the Special Rapporteur continue to examine and report on contemporary forms of slavery. This mandate, which includes issues such as traditional slavery, debt bondage, serfdom, forced labor, children in slavery and slavery-like conditions, sexual slavery, forced and early marriages, and servile forms of marriage, has been effective in raising awareness and providing insights into how modern slavery operates and recommendations to eradicate modern slavery in a human rights friendly manner. And this is particularly true in the context of COVID-19. During the 45th session of the Human Rights Council last September, the Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Slavery presented a report entitled Impact of the Coronavirus Disease Pandemic on Contemporary Forms of Slavery and slavery-like practices. The report importantly highlighted that the situation of individuals vulnerable to slavery or already in slavery prior to the COVID-19 pandemic has worsened. The Special Rapporteur noted that the rise in extreme poverty and inequality is likely to reinforce disparities, magnify social and economic tensions, and generate more migration flows, 
all of which increases people's vulnerability to slavery, including trafficking in persons, debt bondage, forced labor, worst forms of child labor, forced marriage, and other contemporary forms of slavery. And this is particularly the case, as the Special Rapporteur points out, for vulnerable populations. For example, during the pandemic, women have been increasingly subjected to intimate part of partner violence and gender-based violence as a result of lockdown measures, which may also become a push factor, increasing the vulnerability of victims to trafficking in persons and sexual exploitation, rising numbers of children in street situations, which also places them at a higher risk of being exposed to trafficking in persons and migrant workers, who have limited access to government social protection schemes, are vulnerable to trafficking in persons and exploitation by criminal groups. Fortunately, the Special Rapporteur provides insightful recommendations to combat slavery and to protect the human rights of persons in slavery and those vulnerable to it. These recommendations include enhancing financial investigations and criminal asset recovery as part of the law enforcement response to contemporary forms of slavery, to facilitate sufficient access to justice and remedies, providing migrant workers and other people without regularized residency status with access to health care, and assistance free from the risk of detention or deportation, and ensuring the effective implementation of the guiding principles on business and human rights. And I am pleased to inform you all that the Council's work to end slavery is not limited to the Special Rapporteur. In fact, the Council also established the Working Group on Business and Human Rights in 2011, which has been renewed every three years and is mandated to promote the dissemination and implementation of the guiding principles on business and human rights. This is particularly important because as we all know, the guiding principles do not just apply to governments. They also provide that private entities must take action on human rights, including preventing, mitigating, and remedying modern slavery in entities, operations, and supply chain. Dear colleagues, I recently had the privilege to speak at the invitation of the African Group in Geneva on the commemoration of the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. During that event, I was again reminded that Africans and people of African descent still suffer from the racism that was once used to justify the enslavement of Africans and people of African descent. In this way, we see that the legacies of slavery are long and unforgiving. Excellencies, dear colleagues, let us all work together to protect the human rights of persons currently suffering from contemporary forms of slavery. But let us also undertake this work to prevent the legacies of contemporary forms of slavery from stretching further than they already have. I thank you. Our thanks there to uh, Ambassador Khan for highlighting modern slavery, continuing in fact worsening international challenge that all member states are facing as a result of COVID-19. I think very startling that image of the pandemic worsening, if anything, and increasing the vulnerability of many of the most vulnerable groups. Well, now let's move on to talking about Chogham 2018 and the UK's progress in achieving the SDG target 8.7. I'm very pleased now to be able to introduce to you the Right Honourable Theresa May. Mrs May served as Prime Minister of the UK between 2016 and 2019. Her premiership marked the culmination of 21 years continuous service on the front bench, including six years as Home Secretary. In 2015, as Home Secretary, Mrs May introduced the Modern Slavery Act. As Prime Minister, Mrs May created a Modern Slavery Task Force, launched a UN call to action to eliminate modern slavery and human trafficking, and established the Policy and Evidence Centre on Modern Slavery and Human Rights. Mrs May, welcome uh, to this event. And let me first of all say you served as Chair in Office, of course, during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting back in 2018, when uh, Commonwealth leaders came together to draft a communique that outlined their commitments to achieve a fairer, more sustainable, more secure and more prosperous future. Now, this included, of course, a commitment to eradicate modern slavery. Now, would you tell us more about this commitment and how Commonwealth countries can proceed to translate this commitment into action? 
Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Roger, for that introduction and that question. And uh, thank you also to those who have set the scene on this important event that is taking place today. Thanks to uh, CHRI and Walk Free for putting the event on, also for the report that they published in July 2020, focusing and shining a light on the, uh, what the Commonwealth countries had done following that commitment made at Chogham in 2018. And uh, I, if I may, I would just like also to thank uh, the speakers Sanjoy and Grace and uh, Ambassador Khan for focusing our thoughts on the impact that the pandemic has had on this key issue of modern slavery, particularly on the fact that lockdown has meant that there are many victims of modern slavery who have found it even harder to uh, come out of that slavery, to, to evade, to, to um, leave that uh, slavery situation, but also all the other elements that have meant that as we build back and recover from COVID and from the pandemic, we need to ensure that we think about the impact it has had on modern slavery and human trafficking and on labour exploitation as well. In looking at the commitment that we made in 2018, I think it was it came out of a recognition from a number of countries around the Commonwealth um, who have had started to take action, like the UK with the Modern Slavery Act, on the importance of this issue, but also that the Commonwealth is a huge um, grouping of people around the world and can have a significant influence on issues like modern slavery. Uh, and if Commonwealth countries can unite and take action, then we will, as we've already heard from the figures, be ensuring that we've, we're able to eliminate slavery in countries which currently are estimated to have 15.7 million people in modern slavery. This is a huge figure and it is a hugely important topic. There are so many people who used to think that slavery had been eliminated hundreds of years ago. That is not the case. Sadly, there are too many people living in slavery today. So it was that sense that the Commonwealth is an important body of countries, of governments, of people that can come together and make a real impact in their countries, but by showing our actions as a Commonwealth could actually help to lead the world in dealing with these issues of, uh, of modern slavery. And it was that that really brought us into uh, seeing that commitment as important. But of course, as we've heard already, you can't simply have a commitment in one year and think that that's it. You've actually got to act on that commitment and you've got to keep the foot on the accelerator. And as we look ahead to Chogham 2021, we need to make sure that foot is still on that accelerator. Thanks. Now, as a global leader and uh, chair in office, of course, of the Commonwealth of Nations, the UK has a peculiar responsibility, I suppose, to lead the Commonwealth towards eradicating modern slavery, Mrs May. So how has the UK really fulfilled this responsibility? Well, I think, first of all, um, by it's important that the UK sets its own example. Uh, we are very conscious of the extent of slavery, of trafficking, of labour and sexual exploitation here in the UK. And working against that has been an important element. The Modern Slavery Act, action that's been taken um, by our criminal justice system. All of these are showing the, the are examples of the UK showing its own way. The, the current government has already has also said late last year that they're looking to strengthen aspects of the act uh, in relation particularly to the issue of perhaps supply chains and uh, and businesses these are important issues so the uk doing its own thing if you like taking its own actions helps to uh, shine a light on what can be done and to encourage others but we also, through our chair in office, we um, helped to fund some work that was undertaken by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and uh, UNODC to look at the legislation in Commonwealth countries and to encourage the improvement of uh, legislation relating to modern slavery. Now, that has been undertaken in a number of Commonwealth countries. There is still 
more to do. We heard from Grace Forrest there about the importance of some of these issues, particularly around issues like child labour. So there is still more to do across the Commonwealth. But we were able to lead that uh, particular piece of work and uh, to get that encouragement work with countries around the Commonwealth to help them to change their legislation. Uh, you're on mute, Roger. <laughs> yes, uh, technical issues. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned, of course, the uh, the UK doing its own thing there, uh, of course. Now, uh, many people will know that, of course. Uh, you were pioneer of that, your tenure as Home Secretary. You oversaw the introduction of the landmark Modern Slavery Act. So just tell us about the key elements of that act. Yes, well, I think that the, the act... Um, aimed to do a number of things. First of all, to recognise that we had elements of legislation that uh, dealt with these issues, but they were disparate in different pieces of legislation. So it was bringing it together in one act. It was also, crucially, it looked at the support that was available to victims. We need to ensure the right support is available to victims. Um, and some further work has been done on that since the act was passed and came into uh, legislation. But it also recognised that if you're going to deal with modern slavery, we need to ensure that support is given to victims so they can come forward and can come out of slavery. We need to ensure that the conditions um, where people are living are such that they don't find themselves taken into slavery, encouraged into slavery, um, or see that as a way out of whatever their difficult circumstances are, perhaps economically difficult circumstances, or perhaps uh, abuse uh, in a home environment, that they don't see slavery as a way out of that. But then the third element that I felt, particularly as Home Secretary, had often been missing was the need to enhance our ability for criminal justice systems to deal with modern slavery. And that's important because you need to break the business model of the perpetrators. And sadly, I use the term, use the term business model because for so many um, criminal gangs who have this trade in human beings, uh, modern slavery is a business and they are making money out of it. And you have to break that business model by breaking up those gangs, by getting at the perpetrators. So we strengthened uh, our ability for our criminal justice system to deal with perpetrators. And that's an important, very important element. And we've seen, um, we see increase, have seen increasing numbers of cases, still, I think, not sufficient. We still got more to do. But for example, we've just seen uh, in the past few days, an important case by the Metropolitan Police in London of, uh, of uh, breaking up gang involved in, uh, in modern slavery and human trafficking. So that action is very important. And then the other element I would like to mention, which I've referred to already, is this question of supply chains for businesses. So we require businesses of over a certain size to report on having looked at what they've done about supply their supply chain and modern slavery in their supply chain. What we want every company to do is to make sure there isn't any modern slavery in their supply chain. So we need to look at how we can ensure that they are taking action on this requirement and not simply putting a sentence in their report and accounts, um, but that they make sure they properly look at their supply chains and take action where, if there is modern slavery in their supply, ch supply chain, take action to eradicate it. Mrs May, thanks so much. Fascinating there. That issue, of course, about saying it's a business. And of course, in many ways, in a ghastly fashion, of course, it is an updating the justice system as your legislation did to try to deal with that. Thanks so much for being with us today, Theresa May, the UK Modern Slavery and Act. Uh, indeed a game changer in the fight against modern slavery. But now let's move on to getting uh, a survivor perspective. I'm very pleased to say that we're joined uh, now by Francisca Awa Mbuli. She's a survivor of modern slavery and founding director of the Survivors Network Cameroon, which is a survivor-led and female-led NGO that works to empower survivors across Cameroon and Africa, primarily through rescue, reintegration, first assistance, and awareness raising. Now in 2018, Francisca was a recipient of the US Department of State's Trafficking in Persons Hero Award. Now she is here with us today, but uh, the internet connection to Cameroon, I'm afraid, is a little patchy. So we've pre-recorded her video for this morning's session. Uh, she'll be talking about how survivor-led initiatives, including Survivors Network Cameroon, has influenced the government's response to modern slavery.
2018, actually three, three years later, I would hero a walk. As a survivor and a legend survivor when it comes to combating human trafficking and modern slavery and all its associated abuses in Cameroon, our work has really made our government to come on the limelight. We started our work in 2015 and actually two years later in 2018, actually two, three years later, I won the Trafficking in Persons Hero Awards given by the U.S. State Department and Cameroon before was a tier two watch list. But due to our endless effort, we were moved on to tier two. Tiers are the way U.S. government rates those countries which are really on the forefront and are really pushing policies to combat human trafficking and the government is really making maximum effort. The tiers are tier one, tier two, tier two watch list and tier three. Countries that fall between tier one and tier two are those who are really doing a lot when it comes to combating human trafficking and the government itself is making main maximum efforts then when you're on tier two watch list and tier three then it means you need to really do something and you don't fall at the range of country pushing to make sure there's no human trafficking in their countries so i will push them but back in 2020 it was unfortunate we dropped to tier two watch list and we are still struggling to do our best to make sure that we move on to better tiers our experience has also allowed our organization to move forward as an expert in the field to combat human trafficking how has our work informed the cameroon's national policies in addressing modern slavery since our journey started there has been a call on all stakeholders including survivors by the cameroon government we have appeared on the national tv specifically to make the presence of us combating human trafficking that survivors network in the fight to combat human trafficking be acknowledged and also to create awareness that was a national awareness that we did because we looked at it that many people are not aware or they don't even know what is human trafficking or modern slavery so we that have known and have experienced it firsthand needed to go on the national tv to make everyone know that this is what we went through and it exists not only out of the country but within the country our work has also pushed the government to bring survivors on the table our work now makes our government to know that survivors need to be inclusive cameron has shown improvement there has been a six-week training from the u.s state department training not only stakeholders and civil societies involved in the fight against human trafficking but we were so fortunate that some of the government's officials were part of the training and that was a great 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 push to make sure that the Cameroon government is aware and want to really be in the fight to combat human trafficking also the common world 8.7 has really done tremendous work when it comes to combating human trafficking in Cameroon and other Commonwealth countries. Specifically, I will speak for Africa because, specifically, I will speak for Africa because I really basically manage the African team and as well as I've made sure that I've brought on board many other Commonwealth African countries, organizations leading the fight against human trafficking to make sure that they come on the same table, which has been of great help to our work. I will specifically say that coming to this network has made me to really know that there are certain things I do and I don't do them well, but this network has really encouraged me and guided me to do what I'm doing at the best to put modern day slavery on the ground. In my opinion, states need to, as I highlighted in the other question, be survivors inclusive. Survivors are those who have first-hand experience what the country wants to combat or what the country wants to fight against human trafficking. So I really wish and pray that when countries want to set on to enact or to put on policies guiding combating human trafficking, they should ask well bring survivors on the table. From their stories, from their experience, they will know which particular angle that they need to target or tackle that specific problems the government needs to bring more vocational training centers on board these training centers i always believe in skills vocational skills because these are things that people who have they are invaluable assets that when you process it when you possess it you can take it anywhere 
and you can get a job for yourself or you can set up yourself and do something and not only with that impact only you but it will go a long way to also train others as well so we encourage government to do something to open up their various vocational training centers that are located in everywhere in their countries in the state on um, open the doors for survivors to be inclusive so i just pray that this is being done by many governments across the world and survivors voices are being heard and they are being reintegrated through these various meetings to have a life back and move on again as normal people in their countries. Effective of national responses. When survivors share their stories, this pushes the government to do something. Also, most of their stories are being shared on various, various media platforms, the internet and media radios and television houses, both national, private and international. When the stories are being shared on this platform, I think the media is one of the leading outlets for messages or news to pass out to those out there in their countries. So the media, when it's informed by our stories, they took upon themselves to do more. And by doing more, what did they do? They shared the story and reshared. Those who were not there when we shared the stories have the opportunity and the chance to listen to it when the media reshared. And also from this, the media can do some things and do a lot of investigations to pass on many informations concerning human trafficking. Also, particularly to Cameroon, I was very impressed back then in 2017, when the spark or when there was like many girls coming back from Kuwait and the then Minister of communication has to go on air through a press conference and that was a great move a great step ahead to combat human trafficking in Cameroon although as one of the leading survivors um combating human trafficking in the country I was not caught but I was so happy I was not caught for a reason best known to them because I know that I'm the one who wants to say the truth I'm the one who wants to give what is real what is on ground so the girls they called gave their positive experiences but I will also back them up by saying it doesn't mean that yours was bad but at least something was done in that aspect and it was being led by the government itself through its head ministry in that sector the minister of communication so I think the government really did did well and things were really done the way we wanted and that's something that he needed and applaud and this is what we want other governments other countries leaders to push on it so we are very grateful and thank you our oh, thanks there of course to francisca Awa Mbuli, highlighting the central role of survivors to policy responses to modern slavery, talking about the importance of truth, the authentic voice, I guess, and how those stories uh, can actually push governments to take concrete action, which is, of course, the focus of all this. Now, I'm pleased for the next part of the session, we're talking about eradicating modern slavery in the Commonwealth, translating commitments into action. I'm joined by Sne Aurora from the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and also by Catherine Bryan from Walk Free. Let me just introduce them. Sne Aurora is the director of the CHRI London office and oversees its programme on contemporary forms of slavery as well as engagement and advocacy with UN human rights mechanisms. Catherine is lead of European engagement at Walk Free and co-author of the Global Slavery Index, which we've already mentioned. She has worked in counter-trafficking and anti-slavery programming and research for the past 10 years. Uh, ladies, uh, talk about what it is that you do. You both lead collaboration, of course, in, in these things. You both are, are fully involved in working uh, with um, the renowned report, of course, Eradicating Modern Slavery, an assessment of Commonwealth Government's progress on achieving SDG Target 8.7 highlighting the issues of modern slavery across the Commonwealth. That report also identifies, of course, gaps in state responses and provides region-specific recommendations. So if you'd like a copy of this report, by the way, the link is included in the chat box. But now I'll hand over to Sne and Catherine. Thanks, Roger. In, in July of last year, the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and Walk Free published this uh, joint report, as Ron, Roger mentioned, Eradicating Modern Slavery, an assessment of Commonwealth government's progress in achieving SDG Target 8.7. Now, the primary purpose of this report was to engage with to engage governments, engage international non-governmental organizations to take action on the issue of modern slavery and all its manifestations. 
We'll talk a little bit about the findings shortly, but overall, the report shows that progress to achieve SDG target 8.7 is far too slow and that all Commonwealth governments must do much more to eradicate modern slavery. The report highlights the need for urgent action to deliver on promises that were made by Commonwealth states at the 2018 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. And we also are calling for states to ensure that these commitments are renewed and but also built upon, implemented at the 2021 Heads of Government meeting. In our report, we outline clear recommendations and a call for urgent coordinated action by all Commonwealth states. So why is this an important issue for the Commonwealth? As has been mentioned this morning, the Commonwealth must take strong action to tackle this issue. Based on the 2018 Global, Global Slavery Index, we estimate that some one in 150 people living in the Commonwealth are living in modern slavery. This is 40% of 40.3 million people. Whether we are talking about forced labor, debt bondage, trafficking in persons, forced marriage, domestic servitude, the worst forms of child labor or other forms of exploitation and slavery-like practices. We need to do something about this issue. Over to Catherine to explain our methodology and our findings. Thanks so much, Snay. <clears throat> so how did we complete this assessment? This report is the most comprehensive to date in terms of assessing Commonwealth government responses towards the achievement of SDG target 8.7 by 2030. And it required a collaborative effort of both CHRI and Walk Free, as well as a number of civil society groups. The starting point for our assessment is a conceptual framework developed by Walk Free back in 2014, which is organized around five milestones, which you should see on your screen in front of you. Each of these milestones covers an element of a strong government response. For example, supporting survivors includes aspects such as victim assistance programming and mechanisms by which to identify victims, including hotlines and training for police. Uh, milestone two looks at strength in criminal justice, ratification of international conventions, uh, domestic legislation, as well as access to justice mechanism. Three looks at coordination and accountability at both the national and regional level. Four looks at addressing underlying risk factors such as labor protections, as well as protections for women and girls. And then five looks at engaging with business and public procurement to ensure that no exploitation occurs in supply chains. So that's the milestone. Sitting behind these are 116 indicators uh, that assess what government action is or isn't taking place. Uh, if you times that by 54 Commonwealth states, we look at 6,000 data points were collected to produce this report. It really was a collaborative effort of civil society groups, not only Walk Free and CHRI, but also drawing heavily on the Commonwealth 8.7 network. There were some 41 NGOs from 18 different countries that fed into this report. We also included survivor voices. We asked survivors what they thought Commonwealth government responses should be. And we were really pleased to see representation from five Commonwealth countries included in the report itself. So as you can see, all in all, a mammoth effort from all organizations involved. Yes, Catherine, it was, it was truly a mammoth effort. Uh, so now a bit of insight into the findings and uh, the findings I, I have to say are, are, are a bit shocking. They reveal that progress in Commonwealth countries towards SDG target 8.7 is far too slow. There's a lot of data in the report, but I'll, I'll share with you some key findings and some specific recommendations for, for government action. On milestone one, relating to supporting survivors, our data shows that every country in the Commonwealth has victim support services, but 65% of those countries report gaps in funding for those support programs. So to address this, we are calling on governments to ensure that support services must be backed up by adequate resources and be made accessible to all survivors. We also see that only 39% of Commonwealth countries have victim identification guidelines and only 25% have national referral mechanisms to coordinate victim assistance. On milestone two relating to the criminal justice system, human trafficking uh, is criminalized in 40, in 83% in of countries, I should say, uh, yet, Despite this relatively high number, there is a significant gap in criminalization of other modern slavery offenses, including forced labor, forced marriage, and the commercial exploitation, sexual exploitation of children. 
Even where modern slavery is criminalized, we found, however, that all countries have gaps in implementation of these laws. Criminalization, as we all know, is nothing without effective implementation, including the regular systemic training for law enforcement and, uh, and legal professionals. Thanks, Nay. Um, just to look at milestone three, so improving coordination accountability at both the national and the regional level, uh, we found that bilateral labour agreements exist across the Commonwealth, but only 21 of these are explicit in providing protection for labour migrants. We also found that in a similar number, although not the same countries, in 21 countries across all regions, there was evidence that foreign victims are detained or deported for immigration violations rather than being offered protection. Our recommendations aligned with this were to improve cross-border collaboration and data sharing to tackle modern slavery and including strengthening bilateral and multilateral agreements on cooperation, repatriation and also labour migration. We also recommend the improved coordination among national agencies through national action plans and national referral mechanisms. Looking at milestone four, addressing underlying risk factors and just drilling into one particular component that we looked at within the framework, we saw that actually the right to freedom of association is actually enshrined in law in most Commonwealth countries in 52 of the 54. However, we found in seven countries that there was evidence that certain groups such as domestic workers and migrant workers were not allowed to unionize. Our recommendations drill down into this further, making sure that all Commonwealth countries ensure labour protections extend to all groups, including migrant workers and those working in informal economies such as domestic work. We also looked at the recommend around the tackling systemic inequality, underlying discrimination that increases the vulnerability of certain groups, and in particular addressing the specific vulnerabilities and disproportionate impact on women and girls, given that 71% of that 40.3 million figure are female. And then finally, we looked at the eradication of exploitation from supply chains. And this was actually the, the, the worst performing milestone of all five. We found that only four countries have uh, public procurement policies in place to minimize the risk of forced labor in government supply chains or require businesses to report on modern slavery risks such as the UK or the Australian Modern Slavery Act. Notably, we've seen no country yet has enacted any form of mandatory human rights due diligence as we've got in France, although that may change with the upcoming EU legislation. Well, our recommendations, therefore, are to identify sectors at high risk of forced labour and to work collaboratively through multi-sector initiatives in order to eradicate these forms of exploitation. We also call on governments to strengthen laws and policies applicable to public procurement and also business supply chains. Back to you, Sne. So during the, the process of drafting this report last year, um, we all know that the coronavirus pandemic hit and it changed everything. Uh, the data that underlies this report was collected in 2019 and early 2020, pre-COVID, when we know that COVID-19 has in fact exacerbated situations related to modern slavery and has created new challenges in the fight to achieve SDG target 8.7. We see that due to COVID-19, already vulnerable individuals are placed at even higher risk of exploitation. In addition, millions of vulnerable workers are exposed to COVID-19 due to lack of access to testing, lack of access to healthcare, sick leave and vaccination. Progress towards SDG target 8.7 is going to be even slower given the impact of the pandemic unless increased and sustained attention is focused on this issue. As we've mentioned, the CHRI and Walk Free report found that there were significant gaps in the response to addressing modern slavery and with the COVID-19 pandemic, the situation has become even more bleak for those who are victims of or are vulnerable to contemporary forms of slavery. The recommendations for action that uh, we have uh, included in our report are very relevant, if not more relevant than ever. If you'd like to read more about our findings and recommendations for Commonwealth states, the link to our report can be found in the chat box. I should also uh, mention that uh, CHRI is also producing a series of 54 country fact sheets, one for each Commonwealth country that provide a more detailed assessment of a particular state's re response to modern slavery. And these facts will be, these fact sheets will be available for dissemination ahead of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in June. Thank you. My thanks there to uh, Catherine and also to Sne for highlighting the achievements and gaps in state reports, also calling on the Commonwealth governments to take action to achieve those SDG 
target 8.7 recommendations and it's a key piece of research and, and as Sam and Catherine highlighted a lot of it undertaken of course before the impact of the pandemic was fully known which has in many ways ways made things worse. Let's move on now to our open dialogue part of this process. We can open the floor to our distinguished guests, particularly the High Commissioners who are in attendance today. And first, we're going to hear from Jennifer Townsend. Now, Miss Jennifer Townsend has served as the Migration and Modern Slavery Envoy at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office since October 2019. Miss Townsend advocates for the eradication of modern slavery through developing partnerships with other nations and engaging with multilateral processes to build international consensus and to establish practical cooperation. So, Ms. Townsend, welcome and thanks for being with us. Let me ask you, if I may, what are the current challenges or barriers faced by Commonwealth states, do you think, in achieving SDG target 8.7, the eradication of modern slavery? How also has the UK responded to these challenges? Um, thank you very much, Roger. And um, uh, let me start by uh, thanking uh, CHRI and Walk Free for, uh, for uh, organising this event. Um, it's, uh, as, as Wayne has previously underlined, it's a vital topic uh, and a vital time to be discussing it. Um, and I think when we're um, looking at some of the really immediate challenges, um, it is worth underlining again uh, points that have previously been made uh, around the effect of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think this is the, we can see this uh, manifesting its, itself in, in three uh, really important ways. Uh, one, as we've heard, uh, the pandemic has increased the vulnerabilities we're seeing uh, amongst communities to uh, the risk of uh, abuses, to the risk of uh, forced labour, to the risk of human trafficking, um, and indeed the uh, worst forms of child labour. Um, it's contracted uh, the uh, access to safe and reliable employment, um, and particularly picking up on uh, the point about worst forms of child labour, um, I think it is a really sobering uh, judgment from the International Labour Organization uh, that the progress that we had been making as a global community um, uh, over recent years has the potential to be put back by 20 years uh, as a result um, uh, of the pandemic in terms of its effect on uh, progress towards the eradication of of child labour. Um, and also, um, as others have also mentioned um, before um, in this session, the pandemic has highlighted the fragilities and some of the risks and dangers in our global supply chains. So um, I think that first and foremost, those, those, uh, those uh, aspects of the pandemic really heighten risks. Um, secondly, um, and also as a uh, side product of pandemic, but not exclusively uh, because of that, um, we see the uh, rapidly evolving modus operandi of criminal networks in the exploitation of people. Um, and there has been a significant growth in this over recent years, and it is now, um, uh, it is now really big business. Um, and ranking uh, up in the top five forms of income uh, for international criminal groups, something that's incredibly um, uh, depressing fact, um, because it means that uh, criminal groups, as we've seen globally and in, within countries, are very adept and flexible at um, evolving their uh, ways of operation, and that increases the challenge for law enforcement um, and governments trying to uh, trying, trying to combat that. And then uh, thirdly, I'd say that the, um, the other sort of big challenge uh, associated with, uh, with the pandemic for, uh, for all of us across the Commonwealth um, is that uh, because of the range of challenges being presented to national governments um, across the board, it has squeezed the space um, for uh, responses to uh, challenges around um, modern slavery, human trafficking, forced labour and some of the other abuses that we've been talking about. It's reduced also the collective resources um, that Commonwealth governments 
um, uh, have uh, to uh, address these factors. Um, uh, and so I think that you know one of the one of these really uh, one of the really key uh, challenges for us all, particularly now as we're thinking um, in the run up towards uh, Chogham 21, is, is exactly that. Um, you know how we can collectively maintain a high and consistent and urgent focus um, across uh, across the Commonwealth um, on tackling these issues. Um, you asked uh, uh, to say for me to say a, a little bit about um, the UK response um, in the face of some of these challenges. I mean, I think that uh, our approach uh, generally in the international sphere has been very much based in uh, in our commitments under the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly um, 8.7, uh, and those commitments that uh, that we signed up to under uh, the Chogham. Um, meeting in 2018 um, and since that 2018 meeting our approach has very much been to work in partnership uh, with other Commonwealth governments uh, where we absolutely can thinking about uh, our national responses and part of that obviously um, uh, was uh, brigaded under uh, the call to action um, working with um, other Commonwealth partners who signed up to that call to action to really look at uh, implementing uh, national plans, implementing um, the commitments that uh, we had made as a result of, uh, of that call to action. Um, in terms of the UK's um, own focus, uh, obviously that acute effect uh, of the pandemic has meant that uh, some of the wider partnerships we've uh, we had to, in the course of last year, uh, quickly adapt uh, to try and respond to some of the uh, some of the really acute uh, scenarios that were playing out. Um, specifically, adapting some of our programmes uh, to uh, provide emergency humanitarian support to vulnerable communities. And I'm thinking particularly of some of the work that we were doing uh, with partners in India, um, uh, looking at uh, uh, safe labour migration. Um, and uh, there was a, a requirement in the course of last year to try and respond to the acute uh, situations that were playing out for uh, for migrant workers uh, in parts of North and, and Southern India, um, but also to uh, adapt programmes uh, uh, around child labour, particularly trying to uh, reduce uh, the specific threats that the pandemic had thrown up for uh, children who had been trafficked in Rajasthan, uh, and who were uh, increasingly trapped um, because of uh, because of lockdown uh, um, situations uh, there. Thinking about the slightly longer term approach, um, the UK's uh, UK's aspiration is is to very much continue working with partners uh, on the root causes um, and the enablers uh, uh, and um, factors that create permissive environments. Uh, for these abuses um, and the way that we focus our efforts um, is both uh, looking at situations where there is a risk of trafficking into the UK, so working with partners um, uh, either in countries of origin or countries of transit there, um, but also working more widely uh, to focus on the global prevalence and we've heard uh, some those really uh, shocking figures uh, around the numbers uh, uh, and estimates of global prevalence within the Commonwealth. Um, so uh, the challenge is, uh, is is very well laid down there. Um, and as well as uh, working with bilateral partners, obviously the multilateral context is really, really important. Um, and uh, the UN framework, a number of those uh, a number of the UN implementing um, framework bodies, of course, are really, really important to the UK's approach, uh, not least the Human Rights Council, and uh, we've heard right at the top of this session from Ambassador Khan about the role uh, that the Human Rights uh, Council has in this, um, but also uh, working with UN bodies seeking to coordinate uh, UN action, so um, the, uh, the uh, group that, uh, ICAC group that coordinates a number of UN bodies 
to uh, avoid uh, as far as we possibly can in siloed working to maximize our effect. Um, uh, and we are also a very strong uh, supporter of uh, Alliance 8.7 um, and the 8.7 initiatives uh, from within the Commonwealth uh, to uh, really galvanize our effort as we move towards uh, those uh, very hard deadlines in 2030 of the SDGs. Um, as part of that multilateral um, environment, um, the UK very much sees the uh, specific and perhaps unique role of the Commonwealth um, as a really key influencer, as a considerable multiplier, and as a community where uh, we in the Commonwealth family uh, are able to uh, share best practice uh, and also to try and uh, underpin as much concrete cooperation um, as we possibly can. Um, and uh, just to say a, a quick word uh, about UK, our domestic approach as well. I mean, we've uh, heard from the right Honourable Chief Theresa May about the uh, Modern Slavery Act, um, and that obviously really was a game changer for us. Um, uh, we've been since. Uh, since the implementation of that act, uh, been looking at regular reviews of ways that we can strengthen our domestic action. Um, and uh, particularly, I think in this respect, we've been looking recently uh, at, uh, at this really core factor around the role of the private sector and the role of supply chain, um, and how we can use our legislation um, to uh, both highlight uh, the importance of uh, the private sector in as being a part of the solution, um, uh, but also uh, how we can ensure that uh, public bodies play their part here as well. Um, we, as the UK government, had uh, the first, our first government statement last year uh, around uh, our procurement supply chains. Um, that was at a fairly high level because it was covering all of UK government. Um, but from this year, um, all UK public bodies who've got a turnover of over £36 million pounds will also uh, provide individual statements. Oh, Roger, I think you're on mute. Uh, I am indeed, yes. It keeps me... <laughs> the way it works with these things. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. I was down to there for highlighting that need to build on commitments made in 2018. Now, I'd like to uh, bring in His Excellency uh, Mr. Jitoko Tiko Levu, who is the Fijian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, let me ask you, what are the current challenges and barriers that you face in achieving SDG Target 8.7, the eradication of modern slavery? How has your country responded, in fact, to these challenges? So thank you, Bulubinaka, um, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests and uh, speakers, let me at the outset acknowledge the invitation uh, made by the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative to the Fiji uh, High Commission to be part of this uh, high-level dialogue on uh, combating or eradicating um, modern slavery. I guess um, one of the huge challenges uh, that are facing small states, not only Fiji today, uh, in terms of uh, this work that we're trying to do in Fiji, particularly in terms of uh, the education of child labor, is uh, it has taken a new turn given the impact of COVID-19. And in that, uh, it has brought additional poverty to our small islands in the Pacific. And the challenge for our country now is to, to come up with, um, you know, new initiatives, new ideas to help in our national recovery process. Eh? And uh, what is happening in the villages now uh, back in our small states that unfortunately our children have been uh, sent uh, for extra labor to provide income for the family. And that is the nature. So we are already focusing on our national action plan, which our government has committed to by bringing uh, together all our key stakeholders at national level to have an input to our national action plan. But before that, our government has already made a pledge that they already committed to the revision of or come up with a formulation of a new uh, child labor policy in terms of the eradication of uh, uh, child labor uh, in Fiji. But um, this twist 
COVID-19 has brought uh, has has um, challenged our government to come up with variations in the, our national action plan eh, to be put together to address specifically uh, child labour eradication. And um, our government, as you know, is all committed to eradication of child labour in Fiji, given the various reforms in the past uh, in our legislations, uh, the various commitments uh, made by our government in the current um, actions in terms of our current legislation, as well as in the past, if I can refer to some of these, uh, the Slavery Convention 1926, Fiji has ratified uh, some of these um, key legislations in the past, eh? the Supplementary Convention on the Abolition of Slavery, Slave Trade and Institutions and Practices Similar to Slavery, Abolition of uh, Forced Labor Convention 1957, Worst Forms of Child Labor Convention 1999, and uh, of recent, our national legislation is trying to um, combat slavery. Uh, it um, uh, criminalizes all forms of trafficking as a standalone crime. Uh, slavery is uh, criminalized as a distinct crime under the Crimes Decree 2009. The forced labor and debt uh, bondage are specifically mentioned in our 2009 uh, Crimes Decree. The buying and selling uh, of minors for prostitution under Article 226 of the Crimes Decree, specifically confirmed that offences such as this is criminalised. So um, our government is on, uh, has made this commitment and has pledged these reforms. But you know, while it's coming up with these all these initiatives to to address this child labour specifically, uh, the action plan, our national action plan, where all stakeholders will come together, and our government is committed to. There's a twist to this because of this, as already been mentioned, uh, because of COVID-19. Unfortunately, in a small state, in our islands, um, children still has to go. Uh, the decent poverty has brought children has to go in the, and labor uh, to, to bring in additional um, income for the family. But I guess um, in addition to that, uh, I may wish to, as you know, uh, most of you will know that in 2018, our Fijian government uh, volunteered to become a uh, pathfinder country, committing totally uh, with other states to accelerate actions to achieve target 8.7. Eh? So we are already committed to that. And uh, we are now just putting in actions policies and uh, national action plan, which we are committed to, to make sure all these actions are time bound eh? and is very critical for us. But um, I may wish to, to go through some of the specific initiatives already in place in the past few years to ensure that we are progressing in our actions. Eh? Uh, excellent, Zeke. I just ask you to be very brief with those just because we are running out of time, unfortunately. Please go ahead. Yeah, just, I just wish to highlight just for three or four issues. One, uh, the support initiatives. Um, our ministry, government agencies, uh, it's, a whole, it's a total government initiatives, but specifically for under Ministry of Women Affairs, there is a toll-free a 24-hour toll-free helpline. Eh? Uh, it's available 24/7, and whereby uh, anyone can call to to come in and uh, you know satisfy the issues and challenges. And of course, secondly, just our criminal justice, the legislation as I've already mentioned, the various uh, commitment of government in the various legislations already been done. And of course, the crime. Uh, and of course, the third one was the coordination from the Pacific Islands. As you know, Fiji is a member of the Pacific Forum, and we acknowledge Australia's assistance in this. Um, to work with regional security agencies eh, at the border to strengthen our border uh, people uh, which comprise of the, uh, the the navy the the military the police within the pacific islands uh, this was funded by australia something that was called a pacific fusion center eh, to ensure that we are all controlling this and of course uh, just lastly the the, the climate change uh, challenges uh, as you know there are various hurricanes that we we had in uh, 2016 and it bombarded samoa solomon islands um, one or two in Fiji, and we were devastated. And uh, this is somewhat, uh, you know, creates some changes in how we're going to look at this realistically. Yeah? All right, Your Excellency, thank you so much for doing that. I very much appreciate you being brief with that. Alas, we are the slaves of time. But thank you so much. That was His Excellency, Mr. Jotoko Tiko Levu, uh, who is High Commissioner, of course, of Fiji. Uh, now, let's bring in our next uh, contributor, who is His Excellency, Mr. Ellison uh, Greenslade, High Commissioner of the Bahamas to the United Kingdom. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us today. Um, I could invite you to make perhaps a few brief remarks, if you would, on your thoughts about this key issue.
I have a feeling we may be not having that connection there. Um, Mr. Greenslade? Ah, I think we may not have miss, Mr. Greenslade. I think uh, for the moment then, let's move on if we may. Uh, we've got a contribution from uh, the Honourable George Brandis QC, who is Australian High Commissioner to uh, the United Kingdom. Now, unfortunately, High Commissioner Brandis is unable to join us in person, uh, but let's listen to his recorded message. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak at this high-level dialogue on the important topic of eradicating modern slavery. I understand this follows a successful event held in Australia a couple of weeks ago. Australia is a long-standing champion of eradicating all forms of modern slavery, as our domestic efforts and international engagement attest. As the Attorney General at the time, I had a close involvement in the domestic measures Australia has introduced in recent years. At a parliamentary level, those efforts began when in 2017, I referred Australia's handling of modern slavery to a parliamentary inquiry, which undertook widespread consultation with business, civil society, government stakeholders, and international partners, including the United Kingdom. The committee's report, hidden in plain sight, led directly to the enactment of the Modern Slavery Act of 2018. Among other things, the Act established a modern slavery annual reporting requirement for over 3,000 Australian businesses and entities. Importantly, the legislation also required the Australian government itself to publish annual statements about potential modern slavery risks in government procurement. We wanted the government to lead by example, and it did. Unfortunately, as we all know, COVID-19 has imposed further challenges on our global efforts to eradicate modern slavery. It's reduced the health and economic conditions for many and made it much harder for frontline workers to reach vulnerable people with support services and information. In this context, international and regional cooperation is more vital than ever. In May last year, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Maurice Payne, launched Australia's Partnerships for Recovery Strategy, outlining our international development program and how it would help the region minimise the effects of COVID-19 while continuing to work towards a strong, secure and prosperous Indo-Pacific. This work helps us address the drivers of human trafficking and modern slavery alongside our dedicated anti-trafficking initiatives. They include the ASEAN Australia Counter Trafficking Program, which has provided practical support to help our regional partners adapt to COVID-19. Australia also continues to engage the Indo-Pacific through the Bali process on people smuggling, trafficking in persons and related transnational crime. The Bali process is co-chaired by Australia's Foreign Minister, Senator Payne, and her Indonesian counterpart, Retno Masudi. It brings together 45 governments in the Indo-Pacific, a mix of source, transit and destination countries, and four international organisations to build cooperation and capacity and to share best practice. In the light of the COVID pandemic, the Bali Process Government and Business Forum continued its work, successfully transitioning to an online forum. As its name suggests, this is a forum which brings government and business together which is critical to addressing these complex issues. And I'd like to thank Walk Free for its work as the Secretariat of that forum. In 2020, Walk Free and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, together with our Indonesian counterparts, developed virtual sector-specific consultations to share innovation and best practice from participants around the world. In addition to these regional initiatives, globally, Australia also continues to engage with Alliance 8.7, a global partnership of governments, UN agencies, businesses and civil society organisations, which was formed to help reach target 8.7 of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Australia was the inaugural chair of Alliance 8.7 and we remain very much engaged. In particular, we're pleased to see a number of Commonwealth countries agree to be pathfinder countries 
which will help all of us to achieve target 8.7 sooner with the help of the Alliance. They include Fiji, Ghana, Malawi, Sri Lanka and Uganda. In 27, at the UN General Assembly, Australia endorsed, with the United Kingdom and many other countries, a call to action to end forced labour, modern slavery and human trafficking. The then UK Prime Minister Theresa May spearheaded that event and, in her speech, pointed out that these crimes have no respect for borders and therefore need a truly international response. In 2018, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting highlighted the commitments member countries had made under the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals to eradicate forced labour, end modern slavery and human trafficking and eliminate the worst forms of child labour. Addressing these issues aligns with the Commonwealth's values of democracy, human rights, good governance, the rule of law, gender equality and sustainable economic and social development, which are embodied in the 1991 Harare Declaration and in the Commonwealth Charter. In addition to the initiatives that I've mentioned, Australia continues to support Commonwealth member states and Commonwealth civil society organisations to engage in the vital work of eliminating modern slavery. For example, in 2019, Australia provided over £40,000 to the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiatives to enable Pacific NGOs from PNG, Fiji and Vanuatu to attend UN human rights mechanisms in Geneva to prosecute the elimination of modern slavery. Participants had the opportunity to connect their field experiences with policy issues in the international level and then report back to civil society groups in their own countries. Let me conclude by reaffirming in the strongest terms Australia's commitment as a leader in this field to global cooperation on eradicating modern slavery in all its forms. We look forward to the Australian Government's continuing, engage, continuing engagement with you on this vital human rights campaign. Thank you. That was George Brandis, of course, High Commissioner for Australia. Now, finally, let me talk and introduce you to uh, James Sarah Thornton, who served as the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner in the UK since 2019. Now, she is responsible for encouraging good practice in the prevention and detection of modern slavery and the identification of victims. Dame Sarah, thanks very much for being with us. Let me ask you first, given all the challenges of last year, a lot, how optimistic are you that the commitment set out in the Chogham communique back in 2018 can actually be delivered? Well, like uh, so many people have said, that commitment made at 2018 was really important. And like others, I was really concerned to read the CHRI Walk Free report last year, which suggested that progress had been slow. And uh, while I'm not sure optimism is the right word, I think we need to be hopeful. And I'm gonna give you three reasons because I think things that have happened in the last year have made action even more urgent. And everything I've heard this morning has convinced me that's the, the case. A lot of people have talked about the impact of the pandemic on global supply chains and the vulnerability of workers. The pandemic has disrupted and illuminated the fragility of those global supply chains. While some supply chains have stalled during the lockdown, others had to go into overdrive to meet unprecedented global demand for things such as personal protective equipment. Um, and of course, workers suffered at either end of the spectrum. They were either unpaid because work uh, just dried up because orders were canceled, or alternatively, if they were uh, making PPE, they were forced into working excessive hours, unpaid overtime in unhygienic and unsafe uh, circumstances. So it seems to me that um, all of us have seen so clearly in the last year that relationship between the vulnerability of workers leading to vulnerable supply chains, leading to a vulnerable economy. And I think that there's a real opportunity uh, for the development of kind of ways of working that we build back together and we do that across the Commonwealth. Uh, and I did note when Snay and Catherine were talking that this area of supply chains was the weakest area in the report. So I think that first point, there's so much more that we can do and this year has um, illustrated that. The second point I was gonna make about development aid, because back in 2018, one of the promises the UK made was to spend 200 million 
pounds fighting modern slavery. Now, while that has been done, you will all know that there is a big debate about reductions in development aid uh, in the UK, going down from 0.7% to 0.5%, on top of the fact that the gross national income has also uh, reduced. Um, I, I've written to the Foreign Secretary, raising my concerns about the impact on modern slavery projects. Um, but one thing I wanted to just draw everybody's attention to, if you haven't seen it, it's worth taking a look at the Developing Freedom Report, which was commissioned by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office um, to the United Nations University. And it clearly articulates how tackling modern slavery really contributes to sustainable development by protecting and maximizing people's agency. You know, that ability to make choices for yourself about how to develop and use your own capabilities. And it's about 400 pages long, so I won't go through it all now, but it sets out 10 ways in which slavery impedes development um, and talks about what we need to do. So let's talk about development and let's talk about the absolute contribution of modern slavery projects to uh, development in general. And the third point I was going to make is about international trade. Um, the whole issue about uh, Xinjiang has meant that, you know, human rights abuses in supply chains have been in the mainstream media. Uh, and I would argue that both government and business have a vital role to play. And the area I'm particularly interested in is international trade agreements. And I, I've written again to the Secretary of State for Trade in the UK to make this point, particularly uh, post-Brexit, as we are developing trade agreements with Commonwealth countries. It's a real opportunity to embed human rights issues uh, in those trade agreements. And for those of you who are um, uh, scholars of the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, you will know that Principle 9 specifically talks about the state's obligation to protect human rights when pursuing economic agreements with other states. So um, it's a tall order, but I do think what's happened over the last year or so uh, needs to strengthen our resolve to take action. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, excellent summary there of, of where we are in all this. Now, uh, by the miracles of uh, technology, we can now, I think, link up uh, with His Excellency, Mr. Ellison E. Greenslade, uh, High Commissioner of the Bahamas, the United Kingdom. We've got past uh, the technical issues. Welcome, sir. Thank you for being with us. Uh, perhaps if you could just give us a, a brief intervention, your thoughts on uh, what we're talking about today and its importance leading up to the next struggle. Thank you very much. I will be very brief. As, as per the um, guidance I've been given. Uh, good morning to you, Chair, Right Honorable Theresa May, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. This high level dialogue, co hosted by Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and Walk Free, is a commendable initiative to highlight the evils of modern day slavery and to encourage global support for positive actions to rid our societies of this scourge. The Bahamas is therefore pleased to add its voice of support today. The Commonwealth of the Bahamas remains fully committed to preventing, combating, and eliminating all forms of human rights abuses, including forced labor and human trafficking. In December of 2013, the UN's Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons conducted an official country visit to the Bahamas, and following her visit, acknowledged the willingness of the government of the Bahamas to combat trafficking in persons. Her report pointed to the ratification of relevant international legal instruments and the enactment of domestic legislation, as well as the establishment of a multi-sectoral mechanism to address human trafficking issues. The report also noted the efforts made in prosecuting traffickers. Very briefly, some initiatives by the government of the Bahamas which have delivered excellent results include the following. In 2008, the government enacted legislation to include the Trafficking in Persons Prevention and Suppression Act. This is a comprehensive and wide ranging piece of legislation which, among other pieces of legislation, criminalizes trafficking in persons and prescribes strict penalties for all aspects of the crime, including the withholding of travel documents and work permits of victims. In 2008, the Bahamas also ratified the 2000 United Nations Protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children. This supplements the United Nations Convention on Transnational Crime. 
a Trafficking in Persons Task Force was established in the Bahamas in March of 2012 to focus on the prevention, detection, and prosecution of human trafficking. A special prosecutorial unit of the Trafficking in Persons was also established in the Office of the Attorney General, which works closely with the task force and with the Trafficking in Persons Unit of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. In 2014, the government produced and launched a comprehensive national anti-human trafficking strategy. This strategy engenders common understanding and coordinated action among stakeholders and ensures financial support of local and international donors. An inter-ministry committee on trafficking in persons serves as the coordinating body for policy matters relating to trafficking in persons in the Bahamas. It provides advice and makes recommendations to strengthen national anti-trafficking initiatives. In 2020, the Bahamas received a tier one ranking from the United States of America for the sixth consecutive year, thereby demonstrating the country's willingness and dedicated efforts to interdict human trafficking and to meet the standards for eliminating modern slavery. The Bahamas supports the view that it is vital to continue to collaborate widely across the Commonwealth and indeed the world and to focus the on the implementation of existing and new commitments. Cooperation between countries, agencies and civil society is critical as no country, agency or entity can effectively and efficiently fight human trafficking alone. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Greenslade, and thanks for your persistence in getting through. It was well worth making sure that we did hear from Mr. Ellison E. Greenslade, the High Commissioner of the Bahamas to the United Kingdom. And finally, just let me summarise what we've heard, or some of it today. I think one of the key points, perhaps, that came from our many participants, and many thanks for their comments and questions, and of course we regret there isn't time perhaps to address some wider issues that uh, we would like to, uh, but let me emphasize perhaps one of the big themes that came out of this, which was the need for Commonwealth leadership, uh, action, shared commitment and action it is clearly crucial. We heard of course the authentic uh, voice of Francisca herself, uh, a victim of modern slavery, talking about uh, the importance in sharing stories as a way of moving the Commonwealth perhaps and states towards concrete action. The importance for the Commonwealth states to develop these uh, at Chogham 2021 to fulfil the Chogham 2018 commitments, reiterating of course the importance of collaboration, that being a key Commonwealth virtue and one that needs to be taken forward, and the key asks really that are put in place for the Chogham 2021 to try and make sure all this is nailed down. My thanks to all of our panellists today, for sharing their insight and inspirations, and my thanks to all of you for attending. Bye-bye.